he tells them actually to put the object of the interpreters on his face, and then he tells them to cover his face with an animal skin, right? So like this, right? Uh -huh. Oh yeah. <laughs> so he's like covering his face. Well, well, why would he do that? You know. Well, so many things about this narrative are just absolutely fascinating. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Saints and Scripted podcast. And today we have uh, an awesome guest and he is also the author of this book, The Lost 116 Pages, Reconstructing the Book of Mormon's Missing Stories. Uh, it's Don Bradley. Thanks for coming on, Don. Hey, you're welcome. And uh, yeah, we've uh, seriously since we started to develop this podcast, like I was telling you earlier. I mean, he was one of the first people that came to mind when we started this podcast. And so finally, I'm so grateful that you came on and, and that you're willing to do this and talk about your awesome book, because uh, that's been kind of my reading for the past few months, as I'm a really, really, really oh. slow reader. <laughs> but uh, luckily, that, that allows it to kind of sit and marinate. Sure. Um, I mean, I think it's great if I can read five pages a night. <laughs> or a day. Just, I'm just that slow. Uh, but it's just amazing. And I would recommend anyone to buy this book. Seriously, it's, it's one of the best books I've ever read, like, like, in general, like, I like to read a lot of fantasy biographies. But seriously, like, this has definitely strengthened uh, my testimony of the Book of Mormon. And in my opinion, reading this is and what's found in this and all of the evidence and parallels, like, in my mind, totally legitimizes the Book of Mormon even further and and much more biblical than, you know, um, I might associate it with. So anyway, uh, we get to talk about it today. We get to talk about it. And um, also, I don't want to forget, this book is available on Amazon. I think that's where most people go to find the book. Most people have gotten it through Amazon. Um, it is at a Desert Book carries it. They may not always have it in stock, so Amazon's the safest. The last time I was there, they had I think two in stock. Did they? Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, so they can the, run out those quick. Could disappear quick. Yeah. yeah. Um, Walmart.com. Uh, last I saw, had started carrying. Which that was interesting. Okay. okay. Well, great. Uh, so Don, we we want to start talking about this, but before, um, would you mind maybe? Introducing yourself a little bit for our audience to kind of get to know you better. Sure. I am Don Bradley. I, uh, I'm a historian of American religious history. I, um, I did a bachelor's in history at BYU. I did a master's in history at Utah State. I've just always been fascinated with the origins of things. And so as a kid, I was, I was a science kid, right? Um, and so I, because I was fascinated with life, I ended up studying like fossils and like ancient life. But then as a teenager, I became really devout. At 15, I had a kind of spiritual awakening. And uh, within a couple of years, that led me to start looking into the history of the church. Because like I said, I'm interested in origin. So anything that I care about, I want to know where did it come from? And so, you know, I, because I was deeply immersed in the church, um, in the restoration, I started studying its early history. So particularly Joseph Smith. So sort of all things Joseph Smith fascinate me, you know. Um, and um, I did my first archival research uh, in the history of the church at the um, uh, church history department when I was like 17 years old. And um, I've just never stopped. And even you came across this B.H. Roberts book that your dad bought you at a Deseret Book or some, uh, some bookstore? Yeah. So actually, my first experience with doubt, very ironically, began with Family Home Evening. <laughs> and it was because uh, it wasn't anything that was said in Family Home Evening. It was the activity was that my dad took us to Deseret Book and offered to buy each of us any book that we wanted. And there, you know, somewhere between, uh, in the journal authority section of the store, somewhere between Boyd K. Packer and Joseph Fielding Smith, I found a book by B.H. Roberts, who had been a journal authority, and we had other books by him. So I knew he was legit, right? Um, there was this book called Studies of the Book of Mormon. Well, when I it looked oh, really dear. interesting, but what I didn't know at the time 
was that B.H. Roberts had never intended this book for publication, and with good reason, because in the book, he wasn't actually presenting what he believed. He was trying to present a devil's advocate case against the Book of Mormon in order to raise questions that then Latter-day Saint scholars could figure out how to respond to, right? And so uh, the book was only published several decades after his death, and buyers at, oh, he had passed away already. Oh, a long time before. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and the buyers at Deseret, I'm sure, didn't know what they were buying. They, they made a mistake. Oh, no. They just saw the name B.H. Roberts, and they, they were like... it was good. Well, yeah. <laughs> they didn't realize it's this devil's advocate case. Ah. So I read the book, and it just completely rocked me. It raised all kinds of questions about the church. But then I started wondering, well, like, you know, if the church isn't legit, maybe, then what about Christ? What about God? And um, those were just issues that I continued to wrestle with, you know, sometimes in the front of my mind, sometimes in the back of my mind, well into my adult life. Wow. Wow. So be sure to that episode. We're actually going to record that after this one. So that'll probably come out in the next uh, month or so or a couple of weeks. So Don, what inspired you to write this book? So my my interest in the subject started when I was just a kid. Um, so I remember being, uh, t I think, 10, maybe, maybe 11, but I think 10 um, in primary. And I remember um, our teacher telling us about the, the story of, you know, Martin Harris borrowing the manuscript and losing it. And I remember thinking, like, we're missing part of the Book of Mormon? Like, like what was in it, right? Because the Book of Mormon is so foundational to the church, right? I mean, what's more foundational, really, you know, in terms of what the church is actually sort of, like, built on? And so um, it was just was unimaginable to me that we were missing part of the Book of Mormon, and nobody said anything about what was in it. And so there's this strange, uh, it has this strange status in the, um, in the church, in Latter-day Saint culture, where it, it's sort of, I've called it like an ever-present absence, right? Um, everybody knows that there were 116 pages, but nobody knows what was in them, you know? Right. <laughs> and so um, I, I was always interested in that, but then Starting about a little more than 15 years ago, uh, my interest grew because I was reading through the Book of Mormon carefully. I was studying it, and I could tell that there were places where, um, like the the narrator, so Mormon, was like referring back to, like he he was echoing things that he had said earlier, or, or alluding back to things that he had said earlier, but. Um, and so to fully understand what he was saying, you had to know what he'd said earlier. You had to sort of like connect all the dots, right? But then you would hit a wall, right? Because you'd keep going back earlier, 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 and then you get to the small plates. So the small plates are actually the, the replacement for the lost pages. So Joseph Smith said in the preface to the 1830 Book of Mormon that uh, the small plates well, that the lost manuscript was Mormon's abridgment of that early his period of Nephite history, and then the small plates replace what was lost from Mormon, right? So that's why, like, you think about it, the title page announces, this is the Book of Mormon, written by the hand of Mormon, and then if you, like, turn the page, you keep going, right, you go past the introductory material that we put in there, like the next part of the actual book is I Nephi, right? <laughs> yeah. So like, what happened to Mormon? Where, where'd that guy go, right? Like I thought it was his Psych. book, you know, <laughs> right. And so, um, yeah, the um, in order to really understand what Mormon was doing, how he was building on his own earlier narrative, I realized we'd have to know something about that narrative. And so I started collecting together everything that I could find about what was in the last 116 pages. And at the time, that that wasn't much. You know, you could 
you could kind of fit it in a thimble, right? And this was just 15 years ago, yeah. right? So yeah. 2005 ish, yeah, maybe yeah. give or take. Okay, about, so wow, so really not that long ago yeah. that we had nothing basically, right? So there, there were a handful of historical sources. Well, and the only historical source that I had seen cited, I think I'd seen two sources cited about how Joseph Smith had told people that um, not only was Lehi a descendant of Manasseh, but Ishmael was a descendant of Ephraim. Oh. And that that information had been given in the lost pages, but was lost. And that's why the Book of Mormon is the stick of Ephraim. Oh. So Joseph was explaining that. Because I guess if Nephi's descendants are half Ishmael, half Lehi, right. you could definitely say descendants of, oh, yeah, so they, that's both, what I've always wondered. <gasps> yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. You just answered a question yeah. that I've always had. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so so that source, two sources that talked about that had circulated, but no other sources that I knew of were out there about what was in the lost pages, um, and like very little had been written by scholars about this subject. So I tried to gather everything everybody else had written, any clues that I could identify in the Book of Mormon text that we have, or outside of the Book of Mormon text that we have, right? Now, I've gotten questions from people. Um, it, it was a long while before I decided to write a book on this, right? Uh, it was a long while before I realized I had enough information to write a book. <laughs> but as I was writing the book, and sometimes I would tell people about it, um, people would ask, well, like, you're writing a book about the lost 116 pages. Like, aren't they lost? <laughs> like, how, how can you know... How can you know anything about what was in them? And that's... Well, that's a great question, right? <laughs> So, so, so the book is actually in two parts, okay? So part one, I describe as the history of the Lost Pages, and part two, I describe as the history in the Lost Pages, okay? So part one is church history, right? It's what, hap what events happened to bring forth the Lost Pages, right? The, the translation of those pages, who was involved in that process, um, how, what it, translation instruments did Joseph Smith use? The, the seer stone, did he use the interpreters? If so, how did these instruments work, right? What was the process? And then um, even like the, the theft, like who may have stolen those pages, right? Maybe who didn't sell those pages, right? Um, and then uh, the second part is, you know, talking about the, um, history in the lost pages. So this is the narrative. This is the, the missing stories. So there are two kinds of evidence. And, and this was actually my question, okay, as I was approaching this is how can we know something about them, right? So I had to, over time, like figure out what sources to look at and what methodology to use to like, piece things together. So there are two kinds of evidence for what was in the lost 116 pages broadly. There's internal evidence. So this is evidence from inside the Book of Mormon text itself. Right? Oh, so this was kind of what you said about Mormon saying stuff right. that he may have been echoing right. what he's already said. Exactly. Okay. Right. Or assuming that we already know from reading that what he's kind of referencing to, right? Right, 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 right. Cool. Right. So 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 that's one kind of internal evidence. So so one kind of internal evidence would be that the small plates cover the same time period as the lost pages. But they just, they're lighter on history. They just give like a thumb, thumbnail sketch of the history. Yeah. So we can at least get a skeletal narrative of that missing story from the small plates. But then when the narrative picks up again, uh, after the small plates, it picks up with the book of Mosiah. So this is Mormon's abridgment, the part that we have, the earliest part that we have after the lost part, right, is Mosiah. And if you look in Mosiah chapter 11, there's a place where it makes reference to a time when the, 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 there's this hill uh, that was north of the land Shilom, and there was a time when the children of Nephi fled out of the land and they stopped at this hill. Now it's like, will you remember the time in the Book of Mormon, that the children of Nephi fled to the hill north of Shiloh. No, you don't, right? None of us do because yeah. it's not it's not there, right? <laughs> and so it's not there. 
So how can he be referring back to it, assuming in a way that assumes that we know it already, if the story is not a story that he's already told us, right? Mm. So this is a clue that actually in Mormon's earlier part of his abridgment, he had told that story. And there are, there are other clues like this, right, later in the Book of Mormon text. So this is our internal evidence. So external evidence would include things like we've got early um, sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, right, like uh, section 10 explicitly, but also uh, little things in section 3 and section 5 that also are alluding to things that were in the lost manuscript. And so we can use those, right? And so each of these clues, they provide like a puzzle, a piece of the puzzle, right? So what, what we're going to get here is uh, imagine that you've got a picture puzzle, a 5,000 piece picture puzzle, right? Giant picture puzzle. And then like, you know, a tornado comes in and it, you know, knocks down the house and it blows off, you know, 4,000 pieces of the puzzle, right? And you've just got a fraction of them left and you don't have anything else to do after the tornado. So you're sitting there and you're, you know, piecing together puzzle pieces. Can you, can you figure out what this puzzle was a picture of, right? You, you'll never have the whole picture because you've got a lot of pieces missing. But can you piece enough of them together to see what the picture was? We, you know, yeah, with a puzzle, you can do things like that. Well, similarly here, right? If we get enough different kinds of pieces of evidence and these pieces of evidence like interlock, right? So let's take a, for instance, this narrative about um, the uh, children of Nephi fleeing out of the land and camping at the hill that was north of the land, Shilom, right? That Mormon is mentioning later on, alluding back to something he'd said earlier that's missing. Well, it turns out that in the small plates, in the book of Omni, it mentions, uses the exact same language. It talks about a time when the Nephites, they fled out of the land of Nephi, right? as part of their exodus that uh, Mosiah the first led them on from the land of Nephi up to the land of Zarahemla. Right. And then when you look at other geographical references in the Book of Mormon that mention this hill, it's always mentioned when people are traveling between the land of Nephi and the land of Zarahemla. It's like a way station between the two. And so putting these different pieces of evidence together, you've got an apparent narrative where Mosiah the first leads his people on an exodus from the land of Nephi up to the land of Zarahemla, and along the way, they camp at this hill, right? So this, is, this piece of evidence would tell us something we didn't know before about Mosiah the first exodus, and, and as we work with the evidence that we have more, we can maybe flesh that narrative out even further. So there are also other kinds of external evidence. Um, there are sources outside the Book of Mormon that sometimes say explicitly things that were in the lost pages. So, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that, you know, Joseph Smith had talked a little bit about Ishmael's genealogy that was in the lost pages. Uh, you've got some associates of Martin Harris, like uh, including his, his brother, Emer Harris. Uh, Emer in a um, state conference address April on April 6th, 1856, uh, in Provo, he talked some about the Lost Pages and what was in them, and he told a little bit more about the story of the Mulekites from the Lost Pages that's not in our present Book of Mormon text. Yeah. So there's another little clue, right? Another narrative cool. piece. Um, so you've also got one of my favorite, and we'll talk about this one more later, okay. is... Um, there was an interview that uh, someone, a, a Palmyra resident, did with Joseph Smith Sr. in 1830, just as the Book of Mormon was at the press, where Joseph Sr. told him a lot of uh, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and then he told him things that were in the Book of Mormon, but he tells him things that were in the Book of Mormon that aren't in our Book of Mormon, <laughs> but they would make sense. Oh. Right? And so we can, we can come back to that later. But there, there are these various kinds of evidence, and like I said, they all provide puzzle pieces that can be kind of logically locked together 
to see what sort of picture emerges. Mm. Oh, that's so cool. I, I get so like, like it's so excited, like, like this anticipation, like, oh my gosh, what's going to be this? It's like almost like when I, when a new Star Wars movie, we get a date for a new Star Wars movie <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my gosh, it's so, like seriously, like learning about what could be in this book and what I have learned. So thank you for that. You're it's a blast about- doing the work. So history, history oh. is for me, it's solving mysteries, right? Oh, so gosh, I love that phrasing. That is so true though. All, all your witnesses are dead and you have to piece <laughs> together what happened from the clues that they left behind. It's it's a blast. So, yeah, let's start talking about more of what's in this book. Uh, I, I We were talking about uh, kind of the start of the book and I have a little mark here and it talks about the Ark of the Covenant. Mm. Can you start talking about that a little bit? Sure. So um, the, the Ark of the Covenant was, of course in ancient Israel, it was like the center of the temple, right? So the temple was basically built as a house for the the presence of God that was understood to be enshrined in the Ark of the Covenant, right? So you got the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies is built around that, you know, the rest of the temple is built around that. And um, the Ark itself is like this uh, gold-plated box in which the stone tablets that God had touched with his own finger were held and carried, right? So um, when the Nephites come to the New World, what do they have in their temple? They build a temple that's like Solomon's temple. That's what it says, like into the Temple of Solomon. Well, Solomon's temple, like I said, it's built around the ark. And some of the rituals of the Law of Moses actually require the Ark of the Covenant. So the Day of Atonement ritual requires blood, sacrificial blood, to be sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. So um, if the Nephites are trying to practice the Law of Moses and they have a temple like Solomon's, it seems like they got to have an Ark, right? Well, interestingly, Martin Harris, in one of his early uh, conversations with a neighbor about the plates, he refers to the stone box that Joseph finds in the Hill Cumorah as an ark. And when you look more carefully at this, like it starts making more and more sense, right? And, it, and it's kind of wild. So like I said, the, um, the um, Ark of the Covenant is a gold box that holds stone tablets. So the box that Joseph Smith finds is a stone box that holds gold tablets, right? That just Um, blows my mind how much, (laughs) how cool that is. So it's inverting the pattern, right? So then there are various um, relics that were associated with the Ark of the Covenant. So the only person who had access to the Ark of the Covenant directly was the high priest. And then there are things that were, according to which biblical account you're reading, either stored with the Ark of the Covenant or actually in the Ark of the Covenant along with the stone tablets, right? And there are various relics, sacred relics, that were found in the stone box, right, on Cumorah. Well, they they parallel each other. So um, you've got, most obviously, the biblical high priest who accesses the ark, right? He wears a breastplate on which are the Urim and Thummim, right? With Joseph Smith, in the stone box on Cumorah, he finds a breastplate which, to which attach the interpreters, which also are called the arm and thumb, right? Um, then you've also got um, like the, um, well, the it, it, gets, it gets a little more interesting explaining the exact parallels, so I go to some pains to do that in the <laughs> book, right? But um, the Liahona was also described as having been in uh, the stone box. Oh, yeah. Um, well, how could the Liahona have anything to do with like what was in the Ark of the Covenant? Well, in the Ark of the Covenant were the um, like a, a pot of manna. So manna was what how the um, children of Israel got their sustenance on their exodus, right? And uh, there was also Aaron's rod that budded, uh, which was like a, a rod that had been used for sort of like divination, right, to divine the will of God during the Exodus. Well, the Nephites had some, Lehi's family had something that they used for these same purposes, right? How did they get sustenance in the wilderness? 
Well, the Liahona showed them where to go, right? They didn't get mana. They had the Liahona mm -hmm. to help them. Um, how did they learn? How did they divine the will of God on their exodus? Well, it wasn't with this rod. It was with the Liahona. So the Liahona parallels those. Even the sort of Laban, that one takes a little longer to lay out. So I'll leave that for, for readers to look at. But like <laughs> even the sort of Laban actually uh, has a parallel in the biblical narrative, like very precise parallel in what happens with the sort of Goliath, right? And how that's related to the temple. So, uh, yeah, so there, there are very exact parallels between this like biblical Ark of the Covenant and then this new and its relics and then this new world Ark of the Covenant, so to speak, and its relics. Uh, and yeah, you talk a lot about the sword of Laban. And yeah. so I, I'm, I'm glad that you said you'll <laughs> leave that to the, re to the reading because, oh, it's so fascinating. It's so cool. <laughs> so as you were starting to reconstruct the lost 116 pages, you, we, maybe we can talk about, you know, in that title, the lost part of it, right? The theft. And maybe before we move on to some of the other things when, uh, with the actual reconstruction, but do you want to talk about the, the sure. manuscript theft a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, it's not been assumed, uh, that, uh, Lucy Harris, Martin's wife was the thief who took the lost pages and, um, that uh, that angle has been played up quite a bit. Uh, probably uh, many or most viewers may have seen the, the infamous uh, South Park episode um, <laughs> where uh, Martin Harris is painted as a dupe and Lucy Harris is the, the, the smart one who figures out that this isn't real and so she steals the manuscript, right? And she burns it. Um, the idea that Lucy took the manuscript and she burned it is a common story, right? So one of the things that I did in investigating the theft of the lost pages is I found every known account of the manuscript theft. So I found 40 some odd accounts, right? Historical accounts. Most of them don't say that much, right? Most of them just kind of say it was stolen. Some of them say a little more detail. But when you line the accounts up in chronological, well, this is what I did. I, I lined them up in chronological order. And then I tried to look for patterns. How does how does the story change over time? How does people's perception of what happened to that manuscript evolve? And what I found is the further you go from the actual theft, the more likely people are to say that Lucy Harris took the manuscript and destroyed it. Now, Lucy Harris was suspected by Martin even of taking the manuscript early on, but no one actually gave the idea really that she had destroyed it. The idea was she had given it to someone else, she'd hidden it or something. It wasn't until decades later that people start saying, maybe she burned it. And then other people start echoing them saying, we think she burned it. And then other people start making it even more certain she burned it, right? And then other people start remembering, you know, like they they were supposedly told that she had burned it. And, you know, but but when you get like a hundred years later, everybody's saying it, right? But when you get close to the event, nobody's saying it that we can find, right? That, that she takes it and burns it. So as a historian, that's not the pattern you want to see, like that the further you get from an event, <laughs> like the more likely a certain story is to be told. That doesn't inspire a lot of faith in that story, yeah. right? So, um, I also found a, a brand new, like never before used source where Martin Harris Jr., Martin's son, oh, yeah. um, talks about uh, what his father said about the theft. And his father said, uh, Martin Harris said he had suspected Lucy Harris of taking the manuscript until she died in the mid 1830s. And she swore on her deathbed that she hadn't taken it and she didn't know where it was. She was a devout Quaker. And okay. I don't know if, if our listeners know much about Quakers, but one of the essential things for a Quaker is you cannot lie. Every word that you say is supposed to be as if you're under oath. You're not allowed to swear an oath if you're a Quaker because every word you say is supposed to be as if you're under oath. So for her to say on her deathbed, if she's about to go meet God, I didn't do it and I don't know where they are. 
That would be a big thing for her to say if she's lying. So then I, I, I explore in the book a couple other possibilities of who may have taken the manuscript, people who had never been looked at before. So now that we've talked about a little a little bit of the stuff at the beginning of the book, and you, you mentioned earlier that there's kind of two parts. There's the part one uh, where you kind of talk about the theft and some of the parallels with the Jewish feasts yeah. and and definitely a lot more, the Ark of the Covenant. But then you have the part two is where you kind of start to reconstruct some of the missing stories and some of the the knowledge that we don't have in the current Book of Mormon. And especially uh, one that's really cool is the Passover. Uh, do you want to kind of describe what kind of significant time we were in when Lehi began his exodus with his family? Right. So, so probably one of the most familiar parts of the Book of Mormon for um, our listeners, if, if they're anything like me, is um, the very first few verses of 1 Nephi. <laughs> so <true>. Right? Because <laughs> how many times have you started reading the Book of Mormon, right? And so you've read 1 Nephi. So uh, right there in the first four verses, right, you've got mention of um, how the, their narrative starts, the narrative of the Book of Mormon starts with uh, the commencement of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah. And it's like, you know, those words, you read them so many times that your eyes just kind of gloss over, right? Like, well, what does that actually mean? What actually, how did Zedekiah's reign commence? You know, what was going on then? And when, when did it commence? And this actually turns out to be incredibly significant when we look into it. So we look into the Bible and Zedekiah's reign, how did it commence? Well, it commences with Nebuchadnezzar II coming into Jerusalem and like laying siege and kicking the previous king, Jeconiah, off the throne and replacing him with Zedekiah. That's how Zedekiah's reign commences, right? And he also ransacks the temple, right? plunders the temple, probably takes, it says in the Bible, he takes all the, the vessels of gold out of the temple. Well, what's made of gold that's in the Ark of the, I mean, in the temple? Well, I yeah. no way, there we go. Like, <laughs> like the Ark of the Covenant is made yeah. of gold, right? So the, the Israelites probably lose the Ark of the Covenant at this time. Right, which represents the presence of God. So it's as if the presence of God has withdrawn from them. That's this is heavy. part of why, like, Lehi is going to take off, right, on his own, do sacrifices on his own instead of sacrificing at the temple now. Right. right? Yeah. So, like, and there's a lot more significance to this that I develop in the book, right, like, to, to look at what, what was going on at the time with this Bab the beginning of the Babylonian invasion or I mean, the beginning of the Babylonian exile, right? Because there were multiple invasions, but this is the, the first one here that begins the exile. And um, the another significance of this phrase, in the commencement of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, is we know when Zedekiah's reign began in terms of like calendar, right? So it tells us in the Bible that Nebuchadnezzar II came in and removed the previous king in the ending of the year. Okay, so this would mean at the end of the calendar year, right? Well, the uh, Jewish New Year, so this means that Zedekiah would be installed by Nebuchadnezzar as the new king around the beginning of the new calendar year. Well, the calendar year begins with the month of Nisan, and uh, that month is the month of Passover, Later in that month, you have Passover. So um, the events that are described at the beginning of the Book of Mormon are happening in the buildup to Passover. Well, one of the sources that I described earlier, uh, one of these external sources about the lost 116 pages about the contents, is this interview that Fayette Latham does with Justice Smith Sr. in 1830. And Joseph Sr. tells him the story of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Then he tells him what was in the Book of Mormon. He, we can verify things that Fayette Latham hears from Joseph Smith Sr. through other sources. Like he tells um, things about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon 
that uh, nobody else says until much later or in things that the Book of Mormon Critical Text Project has proved about the order of, you know, what was translated then. Oh, you know, wow. Like, and he never he, personally read the Book of Mormon he either. Never read so the he would have Mormon. never known. He wasn't a Latter-day Saint. He yeah. doesn't remember a single name from the book. He appears to have never <laughs> read it, right? <laughs> but he, yet he's... He doesn't remember one name, <laughs> but he remembers stories that he was told without the names, right? Um but uh, he's got details about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon that only an insider would know and that we can validate in other ways, right? Like, um, like the que a question that scholars have asked is, for a long time, is when Joseph lost the manuscript, did he pick up the translation afterward where he'd left off? Or did he go back and do the small plates right. to replace them and then go from there, right? And Latham actually says that Joseph picked up where he left off, right? Well, now, you know, many years later, the manuscripts of the Book of Mormon actually show when they've been analyzed by royal scouts, and they show that that's the case, right? And, and Joseph Smith's sister says the same thing, but she says it 25 years after Latham said it, right? Oh, okay. So, so it's another member of Joseph Smith's family telling it, just like Joseph Smith Sr. tells it to Latham. Right? Ah, yes. So Latham says things that are legit. So Latham, um, Joseph Sr. is giving him the narrative of the Book of Mormon after he tells him about it's coming forth. And he tells him about, you know, like a prophet who leads his family out by the Red Sea and they, they're, they travel like three days. And, you know, uh, he sends, he only remembers one son, but he sends his son back to get this record that they'd left behind, right? You mentioned it's like brass plates and yeah. he gets some things garbled. Like he thinks the brass plates are something different from the record. Oh you know? yeah, that's but, right. But he clearly is like, he's clearly heard the story. He's just getting parts mixed up, right? Then he starts t adding details. He starts giving details of the story that aren't just obvious confusions. They're like new things. So for instance, he says, that when he doesn't remember the names, but that when this guy's son, Nephi, goes and finds the record's owner, Laban, lying drunk in the street, that the guy is drunk because of a great feast going on at the time, right? And so I started exploring that, right? Like, you know, like, would that fit with the Book of Mormon text that we have? Well, you know, Laban was drunk. But the record says that Laban had been out by night with the elders of the Jews. So if he's just out carousing, he's got pretty high profile drinking buddies, right? The elders of the Jews, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. And then when, uh, when Nephi, pretending to be Laban, talks to Laban's servant and, you know, asks him to bring the plates, the sacred record, out to the gates of the city, you know, uh, you know, like he doesn't. Zoram apparently doesn't see anything amiss in this. Like, I don't know, if your master is just like drunk and carousing, why does he need to bring the sacred record out? But if it's a festival context and he's out with the elders, well, then the sacred record makes sense, right? Also, Laban is dressed up pretty fancily for going out by night drinking with his buddies. He's wearing like armor and he's carrying a sword, right? Like, yeah. This seems more like a ceremonial occasion, which you had at uh, the beginning of Passover and the, be and the end of Passover, right? Yeah, that Passover setting would fit the context of, you know, the commencement of the reign of Zedekiah or in the right time period, right? Um, it would uh, also fit, there are other things in that narrative so when the spirit speaks to Nephi and he says, uh, it is better that one man should perish than that a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief, he's using almost, the spirit's using almost the exact words that Caiaphas is going to use at Passover about Jesus Whoa. 600 years later. Whoa. So, so Caiaphas, it says in the Gospel of John that at Passover, um, Caiaphas said, it is better that one man should perish than a nation. And it says that he was speaking prophetically as the high priest, right? And so um, is it just a coincidence that this Passover passage about Jesus 
is on the lips of this, you know, is something spoken by the spirit to Nephi at this time, right? And anyway, there are other evidences that all converge. There, there are things that Lehi sees in his vision, right? There are things that he tells his son during sons during this period about the Lamb of God, which, which again, like Lamb of God, we're talking like Passover, right? The meaning of the Passover, and so. Um, the um, that that chapter was also published actually separately as an article in the journal Interpreter, so it's online. Oh, cool! Um, and where can you find that? Just the interpreter.com or something? Oh, I don't remember. Oh, okay, we'll maybe, <laughs> maybe link it in the description. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's internal Interpreter, a journal of I think it was originally Mormon scripture. I don't know if they've changed. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe it's Restoration scripture. I don't know, but um, and and the I for me this like. I love it for so many reasons, but for me, it reframes the beginning of the Book of Mormon, right? So we talk about the Book of Mormon as being like a book about Christ, like another testament of Jesus Christ, right? But, you know, I mean, you start reading the narrative and it's a story about this guy, Lehi, and his family. It's a story about this little band of Jews 600 years before Christ. But when you look at the full context, right, that this is happening at Passover and that they are delivered from their enemies at Passover and that Christ is revealed to Lehi through his visions as the, the Lamb of God, right, who would be the Redeemer of the world. And this is happening at Passover, right? Then we can tell that Lehi's and his family's deliverance is a, it's like a type, it's like a, it's like in, in a way like symbolic of or echoing the deliverance of all of us through the Lamb of God, right? And so it helps to sharpen the Book of Mormon's message about Christ. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, see, just again, how, you know, I've said many times on these episodes that the Book of Mormon is kind of my anchor in all of this craziness of the faith crisis and yeah. struggling with, you know, my testimony and all that stuff. And and I mean, and 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 Don's saying a lot of stuff about what's in the book. But let me tell you, I mean, there is just so much in this book. It is so rich with so many stories and details and uh, history. So I mean, I would even say if 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 you're not a member, it's just fascinating history and parallels with ancient Israel, which is, which is so amazing. And so we're, we're really grateful to have you on Don. And uh, I think we want to talk about one more thing in the book yeah. and it's uh, Mosiah. Now remember Mosiah the first or the second and the interpreters. Mosiah the first. Oh, right. Because it's, oh yeah, <laughs> that makes sense because he's not really mentioned too much in the, the current book of Mormon we have. And, and that's kind of, you talk about that a lot in the book as well. Right. Right. So one of the, um, probably my favorite part of this book and like my favorite um my favorite narrative from the lost 116 pages that we can know something about would be the story of king mosiah the first so king mosiah the first for um just to call it to memory like where he fits right so he is a benjamin's father so benjamin has a father named Mosiah, and then he has a son named Mosiah. So Mosiah the first and Mosiah the second. So Mosiah the first, his narrative is entirely covered in the lost pages. So we just get a thumbnail sketch, you know, several verses in Omni that condense his story for us. Okay, specifically right. in Omni. Okay. Right. Right, right. I want to go back and read right. Omni yeah. just to get some yeah. context on that. Yeah, so that gives a skeletal narrative so we know something about him. And he, he, so he leads an exodus from the land of Nephi to the land of Zarahemla is the main thing that tells us. But it, it throws in some like additional details where we can, <laughs> we, if we read really closely, we can, we can see more and connect it with other puzzle pieces, right? Cool. Um, so the... When Joseph begins translating again, he picks up with the story of King Benjamin in King Benjamin's old age, right? So, we, so we're so we missing all the way up, all the story of Mosiah, except what's in this little summary in the early reign of King Benjamin, right? Right. Okay. So um, 
Something that scholars have noted for a long time about the Book of Mormon is that the Book of Mormon, um, it, it doesn't, it raises certain questions that it doesn't answer. And one of the questions that it raises that it doesn't answer is, how did the Nephites get the Jaredite interpreters? So we know where the interpreters originally come from. They're two stones that God gives to the brother of Jared on Mount Shelem, right, which is described in Ether chapter 3. Then they're handed down among the Jaredites, apparently, apparently to Ether, right? Hmm. But then later on, we have King Mosiah II definitely described as using them to translate. Um, we have passages that there's controversy about it because there are changes in the manuscripts and so on. But it appears that King Benjamin actually had the interpreters based on the earliest manuscripts of the Book of Mormon. Oh. Okay, And then there's a clue in Omni that King Mosiah I had the interpreters because a Jaredite stone record is brought to him and he interprets it. Well, how is he going to interpret it? I mean, that's what the interpreters are for, yeah. right? That's what Joseph Smith uses them, Mosiah II used them to interpret languages, right? So it's implied that Mosiah I had them. So he's the first guy it suggested had them. And then we're certain that like in the next couple of generations, his, his offspring had them, right? But how did they get to those guys. How, where would Mosiah the first have gotten them if they had belonged to the Jaredites? Now, it's weird that the Book of Mormon doesn't describe this. And, and why is it weird? Here's why it's weird. If you look at what the Book of Mormon says about the small plates, you can show like a genealogy, so to speak, like what scholars call provenance of the small plates, who handed them down to whom, for a thousand years, for the entire time from Nephi down to Moroni, you can track the small plates. That's how meticulous the Book of Mormon is in describing where the sacred relics got passed. But then it's going to do that with the small plates. But then for the interpreters, it's not going to say anything about how they got from the Jaredites to the Nephites. Mm. No, <laughs> no. So, so why is that story missing from the Book of Mormon? Well, it's not, right? Because the Book of Mormon is Mormon's abridgment of the history, right? And we're missing the first part of that book, right? And it's suggested, we, we know that like Mosiah II and Benjamin had these interpreters, and then it's implied that Mosiah I had them. Well, that takes us back to the time of the small, I mean, the, the lost manuscript. So the reason we don't have that narrative is it was in the first part of Mormon's narrative. It was in the lost manuscript. Mm. So then how can we know what the story was if it's in the lost manuscript? Uh, how can we know? How can we know? <laughs> so part of how we can know, or most of how we can know actually, is that it just so happens that when Joseph Smith Sr., talks to this neighbor, Fayette Latham, about what was in the Book of Mormon, he tells them a story about how the Nephites found the interpreters. Right? That's so cool. <laughs> so the story that he tells him is basically uh, that uh, they were journeying, the Nephites were journeying in the New World some, sometime after their arrival. And, and if it's Mosiah the first, as I'm arguing, it'd be like hundreds of years after their arrival, right? And they they have a tabernacle when they're in the wilderness. So like the ancient Israelites, when they traveled, tabernacle is the portable version of a temple, right? You're on the go. You can't have a stone temple. You have a big tent, right, as a temple. So um, they have this tabernacle. They're traveling. So it's implied that they're on a kind of exodus. Right. Um, there are only two times, by the way, when the Nephites are in between stationary temples, and it's when they first arrive in the New World, right, and they haven't built Nephi's temple yet, and when they're on their exodus between the land of Nephi, where they had a temple, and the land of Zarahemla, where they would build a temple. So this detail that they are on a journey where they have a tabernacle pretty much tells us this is, it's either Nephi that's being talked about or it's Mosiah the first. 
right? Um, so um, it, the, the uh, account from Justice Smith Sr. says that um, on this journey, they find something they didn't know the use of. They find an object, like a relic, right? And this guy, um, again, Latham doesn't remember names. He actually calls him they, although he's clearly referring to a single person. Oh, okay. And this guy carries the interpreters into the tabernacle, right, where the presence of God resides, like behind the, the veil of the Holy of Holies, right? And the Lord, voice of the Lord asks him, what is that in your hand? And the guy answers and says he did not know but had come to inquire. And then the Lord tells him to put the object on his face, right? And I'll, I will, I will demonstrate. Oh, cool. Like so, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he does, and he can see anything. It's the interpreters, is what Latham's account says, right? Um, and so um, he tells, oh, well, I forgot a detail. He tells them actually to put the object, the interpreters on his face, and then he tells him to cover his face with an animal skin, right? So like this, right? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so he's like covering his face. Well, well, why would he do that? You know? Well, so many things about this narrative are just absolutely fascinating. For one thing, it has every earmark of genuine Book of Mormon narrative, even though it's not in the Book of Mormon. Book of Mormon narratives are constantly echoing the biblical exodus. There's been a lot of work done on identifying those echoes. Um, this whole narrative of like the Lord asking him, what is that in your hand there? Well, that's Exodus 4 verse 1. That's Moses up on Sinai at the burning bush. The Lord asks him, what is that? What is in thine hand? And it's his rod. It's his staff, right? Um, uh, the Lord telling this guy uh, to like put something over his face, to veil his face, well, that's Moses coming down from Sinai when his face was shining. So he put a veil over his face, right? Um, the um, uh, covering his face with an, specifically using an animal skin. Well, that's uh, on the biblical Exodus. The tabernacle, the outer covering of the tabernacle was supposed to be made of animal skins. And when they transported sacred relics during their Exodus, they were supposed to wrap them in animal skins. Wow. Right? So that's Exodus as well. This is all echoing the Exodus. Not only does it echo the Exodus, it back earlier in sacred history, it parallels things later in sacred history. So everybody's familiar with, and many people are scandalized by the fact that Joseph Smith, when he uses his seer stone, he, he pops the stone into a hat right, and then puts his face in the hat to, uh, you know, like block out the light, right, so he can see better within the darkness, uh, like a, a spiritual light, right. So um, this raised an idea, right? <laughs> um, Oh, yes. What was Joseph Smith's hat made out of? Don't say animal skin. No so way. I looked it up. <laughs> oh my gosh, no way. Of all the sources, there's only one that mentions what it was made of. Okay. But it was Charles W. Brown. And his, fa his father-in-law, William Stafford, had seen Joseph Smith use his seer stone in his hat before and had described it as a beaver hat, a beaver skin hat. Okay. What? <laughs> oh my gosh, no way. Yeah. Wow. Another one of those things is like, that can't just be a coincidence. That's not There's a coincidence, no way. Right? So, so what Joseph Smith is doing is not just putting his face in a hat, right? He's specifically putting his face in an animal skin. Wow. And like, this would have some significance to him that's probably related to what's going on in this narrative, right? Which is itself paralleling biblical narratives. Um, so there's a lot going on here, and there's there there are even uh, this is obviously something I wouldn't get into a lot, but there there are parallels to the temple, right? So the voice of the Lord I mentioned is is understood. The presence of the Lord is understood uh, 
in ancient Israel to reside in the Holy of Holies, right, where their ark is kept. And that is covered by a veil, right? So when the guy walks in with this object in his hand, and the voice of the Lord asks him, what is that in your hand? The voice of the Lord is presumably speaking to him from behind, from the Holy of Holies behind the veil. Right? Well, the guy answers that he did not know, but had come to inquire. Now, those are Lathan's exact words, and Lathan was never a Latter-day Saint. Wow. So that's something to explore. Right? <laughs> yes. And this actually put me onto the fact that if you look at the story of the brother of Jared, he speaks with the Lord through the veil, right? Like the veil, right? It, oh, yeah. Like not the symbolic, like the <laughs> literal one, right? right. Like, or flip that, maybe. Um, <laughs> but um, he, um, the Lord reaches his hand through the veil, right? Um, and proceeds to ask the brother of Jared a series of questions, right, to test his faith and knowledge. And when the brother of Jared passes the test, he admits him into his presence and gives him a revelation of things that he can't share with other people, which he then puts into the sealed portion, right? That's the story of how the Jaredites got the interpreters. And it has all kinds of temple resonances. This story is the story of how the Nephites got the interpreters Wow. And it's like the other, it's like a different part of the same story, right? It's again like a dialogue through the veil. It has all sorts of temple resonances, which, which I develop much more fully in the book. I have a lot more room <laughs> to do that. <laughs> yes. Than in a podcast. But <laughs> okay. And that's why I totally recommend you getting this book because, uh, I mean, as I said earlier, and as Don said that, Yes, he's talked a lot about what's in the book, but there's so much more and so much more context. And I mean, there, I mean, you just do chat. There's like a whole chapter, like a 20, 30 page chapter on the manuscript theft itself and who it might have been. So there's just so much detail and and just so honored to have you on, Don, to talk about this. And thank you again for coming on. I, I just I'm excited for our listeners and our viewers to watch and listen to this. So. Yes, thank you again uh, for tuning in to another episode of the Saints Unscripted podcast. This is still in season one, Faith Crisis. So please comment below what you learned from Don today and or what you enjoyed in this episode. And or if you've read this book and you have other insights that you want to add. Also, feel free to DM us if, if you want to talk to us and subscribe so you can make sure to watch these videos that come out every Sunday. And we'll see you next time. Bye.